Welcome to the Changing Earth Podcast with Sarah F. Hathaway. Blending survival, fiction, and fact to bring you entertaining education that will help you dream, survive, and thrive. And now, here's your host, Sarah F. Hathaway. Hello and welcome to the Changing Earth Podcast. I'm happy to have you back with me this week. Today is a pretty cool episode because today I get to introduce my YouTube viewers to Dale and Lisa Goodwin for the very first time. Dale and Lisa Goodwin are the hosts of Survivalist Prepper and they are some fantastic people that really just welcomed me immediately into their community and I couldn't thank them enough for their love and their friendship. So last week on the day after Disaster Story, Erica was just getting up and moving around. She's just, you know, tr- kind of coming to her wits and, uh, you know, exploring this new this new area that she's in. And this week she's going to, you know, get to know Henry and Carol a little bit better. And they share some stories, so it's going to be a lot of fun. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get into the Day After Disaster Story. Day After Disaster by Sarah F. Hathaway. Chapter 7. Pain and fatigue caused Erica to pause when she reached the top of the stairs. She looked out at the layout of the loft. The remaining hay that Carol and Henry had stored in the barn after the quake had been stacked into walls to make rooms. The first area at the top of the stairs had been made into a kitchen area. In years past, Carol had insisted that Henry drag a huge old stove into the hayloft. It was the kind where you built the fire inside and didn't rely on conventional energy sources. Henry had wanted to sell it in a yard sale, but Carol was his only love, and she loved the antique stove. So he had hauled it up to the hayloft as she insisted. The stove was now one of the focal points of the kitchen, and one of the two heating sources in the barn. Across from the kitchen area was an eating and sitting area. There was a table with a couple of chairs and a side table with an oil lamp in the corner. After that, there was a hallway right down the middle of the loft, formed from the blankets that were hung as doors in between the haystack walls. The first room on the right looked as if it had some other purpose, while all the other rooms were clearly made for sleeping. The final room in the back left corner of the loft was still stacked full with hay. Carol was busy fixing a meal of roast beef, carrots, corn, and potatoes. Her back was to Erica, and she jumped when Erica asked, Carol, is there a restroom I can use? Carol turned around with wide eyes and said, Oh my goodness, honey, you can't sneak up on an old woman like that. I'm sorry, though, I should have showed you when you woke up. Look over here. Carol wiped her hands with a damp towel and put it down on the counter Henry had made for her. It was a piece of the counter from their old house that he had recovered out of the wreckage. Carol began walking down the hallway, but stopped at the mystery room on the right. Once the curtain was pulled back, Erica could see that there was a hay bale with a dish of water and some soap on one side and a portable potty from an old boat in the back. It's not the best toilet, and it smells pretty bad if it's not changed often. We ran out of the blue stuff to knock the smell down last month. Never thought I would need that much of it. Oh well, no matter, my wonderful Henry keeps it clean. We do have an outside place to go, but until you get healed up a little more, I think you better stick to using this one. Thanks, Carol, for everything. Erica had tears in her eyes when she said this, overwhelmed by the amount that this couple had done for her and her inability to repay them. Carol had seen this and quickly said, Now don't you worry about everything all at once. There'll be plenty of time for that later. Carol walked away and Erica proceeded into the bathroom. The toilet wasn't very smelly and had probably just been changed. It was nice to finally do something almost normal. It seemed like nothing was normal anymore. Nobody had come to save anyone. To Erica, the whole world was wrong. Whenever a disaster happened, there were people to help. They would fly across the whole country to help those in need. But this was different. In Erica's little pocket of the world, she could not see that it wasn't only a local disaster or a national disaster, but a worldwide disaster that no one in any corner of the world could escape. 
No one came to help because everyone needed help, even the helpers. People were fighting to save loved ones and survive in an environment that was just beginning to unleash its fury. When Erica was done, she went over to the basin to wash her hands. She dipped them into the chilly water, then rubbed her hands with the bar of soap. While she was scrubbing, she noticed the beautiful designs on the rim of the basin. They looked like small dragons flying around the edge. Her son was born in the year of the dragon. Suddenly, Erica was snapped out of her daydream when Carol asked if everything was all right. Yes, I'm fine, just finishing up, Erica answered. Then she dipped her soapy hands back into the water. When she opened the curtain, Carol was there waiting for her. Come back here. I want to show you something. I know you like to look outside, and this used to be a big old wooden door, but Henry turned it into this. Carol pulled back another blanket that was draped over an area of the wall in the back of the barn. This area was obviously their sleeping area. Erica was standing in front of a huge window. Now whenever you want to look out, you don't have to waste your energy on those stairs. You just come back here and enjoy yourself. Thanks, Carol. There's just no end to your generosity, and I'll never be able to thank you enough. You don't have to. The Lord teaches us to be charitable. In his infinite wisdom, he has blessed us with minds that we can use for great good and great evil. His path leads us to the use of the mind for great good. I believe rescuing you was part of some grand plan of the Lord's. You are special, Erica. If you weren't, you would never have made it out of there at all. No one else that I know of did. The Lord has to have some reason for saving you. So don't thank me. Thank him. Erica had never thought about her experience or her life in that way before. The thought that the Lord individually crafted each one of us for some unknown purpose was rattling around inside her mind. Carol and Erica stared out the window, lost in thought. They could see to the very edge of the forest, to where the toxic lagoon began. I used to have a lot of friends down there, and the Lord did not save them, Erica said with a quivering voice. Actually, two of my very best friends and their daughter were probably down there. Lots of people died down there, Erica. When the quake hit us, everything was rattling like a freight train was coming right through the house. Then the house started coming down. Henry had been outside, and he came running in the door. We ran out to the wine cellar, and we hid down there. All the bottles were shaking, but they stayed put, and we made it. When we opened the door, the whole house was gone. Trees that had stood for 180 years were shaken from the ground. The roads, everything was broken except for the barn. Henry says it has something to do with how the foundation was laid, but I don't know about those types of things. I tend to think that it was a miracle, or maybe the will of our Lord kept our barn standing. Now it's our sanctuary. I don't know what happened to everyone else. Besides Henry, you are the only person I've seen since the quake. We used to go every day to the lagoon to look for survivors, but now we only go once a week. And Henry always insists on being with me whenever we go anywhere off the property. Carol was rambling. She was just happy to discuss life with another individual. Erica and Carol were still staring out of the window while they were talking. Far off in the distance, the cloud from the eruption could still be seen. That cloud may come this way if the wind shifts. Hopefully our luck will hold, Carol said as if to herself. Oh well, we'll worry about that when the problem comes. Until then, we will just pray. Dinner is just about ready. I bet you could use a rest. Why don't you go sit at the table while I get dinner served and call that man in from his tinkering? Carol was already walking into the kitchen, so Erica followed her and sat down delicately on a chair at the table. It had a nice soft cushion, so Erica's burns didn't sting too badly, and it felt nice to rest her legs. Carol hummed as she worked around the kitchen. The roast smelled awesome when Carol took it out of the oven and pulled off the lid. Erica's mouth was watering, 
but Carol proceeded to neatly set the table and then went down the rickety stairs to get Henry. Erica was so hungry and the meat smelled so good, it felt like forever before she heard voices and then two sets of feet coming up the stairs. Well, well, still on the move, Henry bellowed as he reached the top of the stairs. Now just leave her alone and sit down, you big moose, Carol countered in Erica's defense. Yes, I'm still up, and the smell of Carol's wonderful dinner is keeping me wide awake, Erica replied in sheer anticipation of the feast, as Henry sat down next to her. Well, that wonderful cooking has kept me going for a lot of years. I'm sure you'll feel as good as new in no time, Henry chuckled. I hope so, Erica said with a far-off look in her eyes. You'll see them soon enough. Right now, let's worry about getting you healthy enough to make the trip to see them. Henry had seen the look in Erica's eyes and knew her thoughts were of her family. Erica wondered how he knew, but felt that he was right. Her mission was to get well enough to get home to them. That's enough chatter out of you two. Let's eat before it gets cold, Carol said in a cheerful voice, trying to break the tension. She was carrying some meat sliced on a platter and a bowl full of veggies. Once the food was served, Erica went to dig right in, but Carol abruptly stopped her. I know you're hungry, honey, but we must give thanks to the Lord for providing us with such a bountiful meal, especially in these uncertain times. Plus, it's the 4th of July, and I think our country could really use a special prayer right about now. Erica withdrew her hand and folded it with the other. Then she bowed her head and waited for Henry to finish the blessing. Erica's prayers went out to her family, and she asked the Lord to give her enough strength to make it home to them. When Henry was done, they dug in, and Erica ate like never before. Everything was so good, and it had been so long since she had a wonderful hot meal with big chunks of juicy meat. When she had packed every corner of her belly full, she sat back in her chair. Henry and Carol were watching her. Well, you must be feeling better. I haven't seen anyone eat that much since my son was 16, Henry said, chuckling again. Now, Henry, you just leave her be. She needed it, Carol countered. I've been saving something for a special occasion, Henry declared. Henry ran down the stairs like an excited schoolboy. Then the door that was under the stairs opened and closed. I wonder where he is off to. Oh, well, I better get these dishes done. Don't want the ants coming in for our leftovers. Let me help you, Erica insisted, and got up to help. Her body hurt and she winced a little. No, honey, you just rest. I got it, Carol replied. No, I insist, Carol. You've done so much for me already. I will feel horrible if I can't make it up to you, Erica pleaded. Just don't overdo it, honey. You're just like my daughter, Christy. She joined the Marines at 18 and stayed for life. Always so strong with an unquenchable sense of duty. She never had any kids, but has worked hard for our country. Carol was just making small talk as she washed the dishes in a big basin. Erica cleared the table, then began to dry the dishes that Carol was washing. Now my son Harold, on the other hand, was always such a lover. He liked hugs and was such a good baby. Now he has three kids of his own. His oldest is a girl named Jen. Kim is the middle child, and his son Rob is the youngest. Do you know if they survived? Where did they live? No, I don't know, but my faith in the Lord will protect them. They lived in Colfax, but it took Henry four days just to get to Auburn and back, so who knows how long it would take them to get here, Carol answered with hope in her voice. Yeah, and who knows how long it will take me to get home, Erica wondered. Just have faith, honey. You've made it this far, and that's much farther than most. Everyone will get where they need to be in time, Carol replied assuredly. Are you two up here bumming each other out? Henry questioned from the stairway. He thought often of his son, and hoped that Harold had the same determination to get home as this young lady in front of him did. But now was not the time to think of the many troubles that were plaguing them. This is supposed to be a celebration. Erica and Carol both jumped. 
Having been so involved in work and conversation, they did not hear his approach. Here's the surprise. He held up a bottle of King James III cognac. Now, let me help you get those dishes put away, and we'll work on drinking away those sorrows. Henry, you devil, Carol said with a twinkle in her eyes. They all worked together to finish up the dishes, then sat down around the table together. Henry opened the bottle and poured them all a glass. Erica took a sip of the potent spirit. She had never been a big lover of alcohol, and this was extremely strong, but strangely smooth as well. She drank down the first glass and held her glass out for more. Now, we can't drink it all, Henry said as he was filling her glass. I'm saving at least half of this bottle for when Harold gets here with Betsy and the kids. He almost kicked himself for bringing up the kids again and quickly added, Anyway, like I said, this is a celebration. How about some tunes while we drink? Normally a radio would have been turned on, but now with no electricity, Henry reached for a case holding a fiddle. He began to play a happy tune, and while he played, they drank from their glasses. All of Erica's pains began to melt away. After a while, their glasses were empty and Henry put down the fiddle to refill them. Now that we're all feeling better, let's hear that story of yours, little lady. Henry was full of anticipation. Before she starts, why don't we go down onto the porch to enjoy some air? It just feels wrong to sit inside on the 4th of July with no fireworks blasting away down in the city. Carol stood up and went to get the lantern in the corner so the three of them could bring it along. She was moving with more grace and ease. Probably the alcohol was having a pain-relieving effect on her, too, Erica thought. Sounds like a wonderful idea to me, darling. I'll bring along the fiddle so we can have some music, too. Henry packed his fiddle back into its box and started heading for the stairs. Erica got up, too. She was still dumbfounded by the fact that it was the 4th of July. Usually, she would be one of those people blasting off those fireworks in the city. Even though they lived in the country, Erica, Vince, and Dexter had always gone down to their friend's house in the city for the 4th. They would all pitch in and buy one or two of those gigantic boxes of fireworks that they have for sale at the roadside stands. Then they would all delight in setting off fountains, smoke bombs, and sparklers, until the road in the city looked like a war zone, with explosions going off in all the driveways and the streets filling with the smell of sulfur. Erica never really thought that the 4th in California was all that great. You weren't allowed to fire any fireworks into the air because of the wildfire risk. Since Erica hailed from Michigan, where there were all kinds of fireworks going off every 4th, she didn't think that the fountains were all that spectacular. Plus, Erica hated the new sparklers. They were designed to be safer, but they sucked. They didn't light well and would burn out quickly. She longed for the old school wire sparklers. Sure, they burned you a little, but they stayed lit for a lot longer and burned a lot brighter. When the three of them got out to the porch, Erica knew that Carol had the right idea. It was so fresh outside. But there was a smell in the evening air that Erica knew immediately was the smell of a major wildfire. Carol, it smells like a fire, but there was no smoke today. Was there a fire, Erica wondered? Don't really know, Erica. After the quake, there were days when the smoke hung thick for long periods of time. It would clear and then come back. Without the TV, we have no idea where it came from. But this is California in the summer. And with all that has happened, I bet some big wildfires burn in more than one place, Carol answered honestly. Wow, crazy. There you guys go, bringing our celebration down again. I know what will cheer us up. You guys just sit tight, Henry insisted. Erica pulled the smoke out of her pack and lit it. Carol and Erica sat in silence, each preoccupied with their own thoughts. They sipped their cognac and Erica puffed on her smoke while Henry went to get another surprise. You know, Erica said, while twirling her glass so the liquid made a little whirlpool, I once saw a shot of this cognac sell for $100 a shot. Oh yes, I believe it. We were just kids when we bought this bottle, and it just about broke the bank. Henry never opened it, though. 
and he has been saving it for a lot of years. He always said, we will know when the time has come to have a glass, Carol answered. It's not so bad, but I could have never paid $100 for a shot. I better get me drunk for a week at that rate, Erica laughed. Some people like to show how important they are by paying way too much for good alcohol. Yeah, I guess all that doesn't really matter now, huh? No, I guess not. Maybe all the rich people are held up in rich person sanctuary. All day long, they sit in their comfy bunker, sipping cognac and eating caviar. Carol was laughing out loud as she said this. Well, I guess I'm in rich person sanctuary, Henry rumbled as he came in, because I am surrounded by beautiful women, sipping cognac and eating better than crummy old caviar. Henry, you are just full of the devil tonight. I will have to sleep with one eye open, Carol giggled. You better, woman, Henry replied flirtatiously. They all laughed. It was nice to laugh out loud with friends again. It seemed like it had been years since Erica had partaken in this banter and laughed. There is something to be said about laughing with friends. It brings joy to the heart and is something that should be appreciated. People used to take this social interaction for granted, never realizing that one day it would be so precious. It relieved stress and gave hope to those who could not see it. Erica had begun to slur her words slightly and was having so much fun goofing around. She was doing a fine job of forgetting the recent past and was not looking forward to retelling the story of her horrible experience in the cell, as she had begun to call it. Henry could see this but wanted the story anyway. Now was a perfect time for the telling. The senses had been dulled and he knew its telling would not affect her as much now. Well, you better get used to telling your story because you may have been the only one to survive. Many people will want to know how you survived the flooding of the Sacramento Valley, Henry said matter-of-factly while staring Erica directly in the eyes. Erica looked up startled. How could this man read her mind so well? Was she so transparent? She wanted to escape, but she knew that he was right. She would have to tell and retell the story until one day it would become legend. The legend of the girl who survived a toxic flood because of cellophane and duct tape. Oh boy, what a legacy, Erica chuckled to herself. But Henry knew that Erica was a very special individual. Not just strong, but deep in spirit and in possession of a very big heart. If she was going to get home, she would need all of these strengths. There was no time to be weak. Erica would have to face the reality of the situation. She would have to face what she had gone through and the bleak situation she was now facing. Henry knew it and would take every opportunity to destroy her weaknesses and prepare her to harness all the strength she would need in the future. So let's hear the story. Henry was looking at her again, his fierce brown eyes piercing her. Erica saw a man that demanded respect and she knew that she could never refuse a direct request from him. Erica began. I woke up just the same as any other day. Dexter was running all over the place, and I had to keep telling him to calm down. I got the dishes done, and I went down to my in-laws to check on the house. My in-laws were up in Washington visiting my husband's grandmother. I could see some raccoons were bothering the chickens at night. I know they are nocturnal, but I was eager for something to do, and Dexter was so antsy. So I went back home, which wasn't very far away, and loaded up Dexter's BB gun, my dog Ripper, and my slingshot. I called Vince on my cell phone and let him know that I would be spending the day there. It was hard for Erica to talk about her family, and her voice began to quiver. We didn't find any coons, but we did have fun running around, shooting. I knew my slingshot wasn't really going to work, but I figured Dexter would have fun with it and his gun. We had a blast running around in the woods. Then I went and dropped Dexter and Ripper off at my mom's house. We talked about our days for a while, and then I had to change to go to work. I hugged and kissed my mom and Dexter. As I drove off in my car, I looked in the rearview mirror, and that was the last time I saw them. I called Vince on my cell. He was on his way home. I let him know we were safe and sound after a day of coon hunting and that I loved him. That was the last time I spoke to him.
After that, I drove down to work at El Primero. I was late because of traffic, so I threw my stuff in the break room and went to work, prepping food in the kitchen. Halfway through the night, this girl I worked with, Casey, came in and asked if I would grab a bottle of our best Merlot for this frequent customer that always acted like an arrogant bastard. Erica stopped for a minute and realized her language may have been too strong to use in front of Carol. She felt like she had just said the F word in front of her grandma and had to apologize. Pardon my French, Carol, but he really was a jerk. Don't worry, Erica, just don't stop now. Carol was more irritated about the break in the story rather than the harsh language. Okay, where was I? Oh yeah, so I went down to the basement, and as I was grabbing the bottle, the quake started. Now, this was not just any old basement. It had originally been a bomb shelter constructed during the Cold War by some lunatic fanatic that owned the house. Erica's story was starting to flow now, thanks in part to the alcohol. She went on to tell Henry and Carol all about being trapped under the wine rack, sleeping on tablecloths and napkins, living off oats, fruits, and nuts, her first failed attempt at escape, and how she thought up the suit and the raft. Then she explained her escape, her first night under the stars when she got caught in the eddy, and finally her long voyage across the toxic sludge. By the time she was done, it was very late, and the oil lamp needed more fuel. Carol got up to fill it. That is some story, young lady. You must truly have a guardian angel at your side. I wonder how many other people may be stuck under the sludge, Henry pondered. I don't know, Henry. I didn't even think about other people stuck in basements or crazy bomb shelters. I didn't even try to look for anyone else alive. All I could think of was getting to shore, getting home to my family. Believe me, Henry, I saw my fair share of bodies above the ground, though. Erica was freaked about the idea that more people could have been stuck in the situation just like hers. Maybe they were still there in cells under the water. Maybe one day the water would recede and they could open their doors into the air instead of a lake. If they made it that long. That's not what I mean, Erica. Don't go crazy over it. You will learn that in life, it's never good to think of the what could have been, only what was and what will be. You must stay focused on the future. No one could have survived without a suit like yours, and you wouldn't have made it yourself if you got to shore any later than you did. Henry was kicking himself for planning the thought in her head. He had looked for survivors for so long that he couldn't help wondering. Carol brought the lamp back to the table and announced, I'm going to bed. It's too late for an old woman to be up worrying. She was looking tired, and she kissed Henry before she headed up the stairs. Erica had watched them embrace and kiss, the way she and Vince always did when they shared passionate moments together. She longed more than ever for the touch of her man and his warm love that always made her feel better no matter what. Everyone has hard days, and Erica had her share as well but the love of this one man could light up her whole world. He would always find a way to make her smile no matter what, and sometimes when Erica was trying to act really mad, it drove her nuts. What she wouldn't do for that feeling now. Good night, guys, and don't keep her up all night talking, Carol yelled down the stairs as she reached the top. Yes, dear, good night, Henry answered as the light at the top of the stairs went out. All that was left was the dancing light from the lantern on the table. So even though the chapter may have gotten kind of serious at the end, it's always an emotional telling of Erica's story because of the drama that she had to live through. But, you know, the important thing to focus on in this chapter is that, you know, the being able to sit down and laugh with people and share in those feelings, it is more powerful than any of us know. And here to talk to us about that today are Dale and Lisa Goodwin. In early 2013, Lisa and Dale decided to create survivalistprepper.net and become a bigger part of the preparedness community. They are not the overboard tinfoil hat-wearing conspiracy theorists although Dale sometimes accuses Lisa of that. They're just like you and me. 
everyday Americans that enjoy the freedoms that this country offers. Lisa is more of the prepper than Dale is, and he's more of the survivalist or outdoor type. And they write articles ranging from first aid to food storage to primitive and wilderness skills. Basically, anything that involves preparedness and survival. Welcome to the show, Dale and Lisa. Appreciate having you here. Thank you. Happy to be here. So you guys have been hosting your show, Survivalist Prepper, for a while now. How have these feelings of laughter and good humor helped you connect with your guests? I, I think it's a huge part of it because we we just kind of are who we are. And then it goes into, you know, our relationship, why we still get along after all these years and, and all of that, too, because I think you have to you have to make light of of especially in prepping of certain subjects or you're just going to lose your mind. What do you think, Lisa? I think um, when it's it's been funny that I've noticed when we're um, chatting with the guests or whoever we're, we're speaking with the the banter that goes back and forth and it just it makes you know, makes it lighthearted and it's fun and, and it's much more enjoyable to chat with somebody when, you know, it's it's kind of fun and you're enjoying it instead of forcing it out. So just being, being happy and drawing that from other people, it's, it makes communication much easier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the, the icebreaker, right? When you can laugh with somebody and open up those good feelings. Yeah, exactly. And it, it helps with, with, like you said, that icebreaker, but it helps with with getting your, you know, nobody wants to be kind of told what to do or yelled at or, you know, that, that whole by the book type thing. Or some people do, I guess, but I just, it is who we are and it just kind of flows better that way for me. That's That's how I deal with a lot of situations in life. And I just don't take, I mean, I take things seriously, but you, there's got to be room for joking around a little bit. Right. Life's too short not to joke around, right? Hey, whatever's going to happen is going to happen anyway, so <laughs> you might as well enjoy it. Hang on and enjoy the ride. Yeah. <laughs> Do you feel that if we were in a long-term survival situation, engaging in this type of activity would be critical to emotional survival? Absolutely. What do you think, Lisa? I think absolutely. Well, yeah, because the you have to be happy. and And if you're in a stressful situation, which let's say that, um, you know, something catastrophic happened worldwide and everything changed and you, there's so much uncertainty. You've got to take time and you have to be, you have to be happy. You got to focus on the positive because that might be all that you have. And I think that it, instead of, like I kind of said, as, as by the book and being serious and all that, that's, that's all going to be necessary, but there's a way to get things done, you know, say you're a leader of a group or something, there's a way to get things done. And then there's, you know, a, a way to get people to respond to what you want them to do. And I think joking and laughter is is going to ease a situation a little bit anyway, to the point where people are going to be more willing and more able to to kind of follow along and do what you want and know that, you know, hey, this, you know, like I said, it, it all sucks and it, it, it is what it is. But Let's at least do what we can. And I think it, your your mental, it's going to lead away from depression and stuff like that where you can kind of build it up as much as you make a, a terrible situation a little bit better. Right. That's a great aspect of it from the leadership standpoint because we're not raised to be um, under a military rule. Mm -hmm. So as a from a leadership role, it's going to be essential that you can really bond and connect with the people who are going to follow you. Or else why would they do that unless they were saw some kind of hope in you? And the laughter and whatnot brings a lot of that hope in the future. So that's a great point about how important it is from a leadership aspect. Yeah, as long as it's it's you're not that's all you're doing is is the joking around, goofing around. But <laughs> there's gotta be a good mix of, hey, I know what I'm doing and, and people have to trust you. And so it's got to be a good mix. You can't be the, the clown because nobody's going to follow the clown. <laughs> That's but. true as well. Huh? Yeah, you just can't be the goofball, and then everybody's going to be like, um, I'm not following this goofball. Yeah. So, But <laughs> on the good. same note, you wouldn't <laughs> want to be the overbearing one either. Yeah, exactly. That dictator type that we all try to get away from. <laughs> yes, that we have too many of probably nowadays. Mm-hmm. So, Lisa, from a nursing aspect, I'm curious if you have seen, if through your experience, some physical benefits to your body that occur 
when your brain is set on that positive mode of feeling humor and laughter as opposed to um, looking at the drudgeries of whatever stressful situation you're going through. Yeah, there it there is. There's actually um, you have happy hormones in your body. Happy hormones. Happy, happy hormones. hormones. I like it. <laughs> so the happy hormones are um, that, and it's so easy to release them. You have oxytocin, dopamine is one a lot of people are probably familiar with because that really that like circulates through your bloodstream and it just gives you happiness. Like if you eat chocolate, it releases dopamine. Um, even serotonin. I love chocolate. Yeah, I love that chocolate. <laughs> Um, and then the for um, and then also endorphins, even things as simple as smiling or laughing actually releases endorphins, which help to keep you positive. And it, and it releases the good hormones for your body versus if you're completely stressed out, that will actually counteract all of the good and it can do detrimental harm, physical harm to your body just by being stressed out. And lead to like depression and stuff, right? Yeah. So it's like the the anti depression laughter. Is- yeah. So even just smiling, sitting here smiling, Dale. And as you can tell, I mean, you can tell when someone is smiling. Um, even you don't have to see see them. I'm smiling right now. Right. <laughs> you, you can you can tell, but that releases the good endorphins and the happy hormones, which is very beneficial, especially in a stressful time. Yes, my mom used to tell me, if you're not feeling happy, lay on the floor and force yourself, use gravity to make yourself smile, you know, and that way you get that positive feeling. Yeah, okay. and it, it really does work. And I think that's that's important um, even now nowadays, actually, especially nowadays to, I mean, make yourself smile because there's so much yuckiness going on. If you're smiling, it's really hard to be unhappy. Right. Right. And in a long term survival situation, we might be looking at a lot of serious damage to our bodies just because of the severe stress that you would be under. And um, I've heard that it, you know, can cause problems to the gallbladder, to the liver, kidneys, just the whole gamut. So, right. Because you have, uh, what is it? Cortisol is released from your kidneys, which um, in a stressful situation, it's kind of goes back to the whole fight or flight instinct and that's just that's like that's in us so if you're stressed out you're going to have the fight or flight response so your heart rate is going to increase your cholesterol levels will actually increase the cortisol production um increases the adrenal glands go into overload the epinephrine your body releases more epinephrine the liver will actually produce more glucose which in a long-term situation that can actually lead to diabetes because then your body doesn't your pancreas can't keep up with the amount of glucose that's being, you know, pumped out by the liver. So then you end up with like long term that could be life threatening um, health concerns. Right. And not the time you want to be coming down with diabetes. Probably not a good time. <laughs> unless yeah, you have a pig and you figured out how to use that pig, you know, the, the insulin produced by the pig, which I, I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> Me neither. Me neither. <laughs> Well, as you guys are parents of five children, so I am sure that you know the importance of laughter to instill bonding and hope in your future. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And actually, we joke quite a bit with our kids. It's just the way our family structure is because we want them to feel like you know, we're not the dictator parents. They can come to us with anything. We joke around, sometimes a little bit too much. Um, Dale. Me, especially. (laughs) But the kids, the kids like that. I mean, it's, it's nice to have kids that like their parents. We were both raised to where I think Lisa, your parents were, that's the reason you are the way you are today, right? Right. Cause my, my parents weren't there. They were always, they were always too busy in their own worlds, doing their own things. And, you know, they would make justifications. Well, we're doing it for you, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, I noticed it while I was growing up and to the, point of where I was like when my kids were born I was like I'm I'm not going to do that I'm going to make sure I'm here for my kids I'm going to make sure that you know my kids can be kids right so I think that's really important and then that just instills that in them and then hopefully they'll carry it on for future generations yeah I I rarely yell or anything like that I'm usually joking around with the kids and that's how I can kind of get them to do what I want them to do but the times that I have which has been like once or twice in like 10 years but they they just kind of get shocked because they're like, whoa, that was Dale. Sometimes they laugh at me. 
Yes, they're like, well, that's, you know, we're not used to that. But it's important to let your kids to for your kids to be comfortable talking to you and interacting with you and not be trying to stay away from you and go off and do their own things that kids that are too sheltered sometimes, I think, can end up being the ones that really get into the big trouble because they they go out and they, they've never done anything. They've been sheltered their whole lives. And then they find this freedom when they go off to, say, college or something. And that's when they start experimenting and doing stuff. So I think it's important to, to have that good relationship, joke around with your kids and, and be able to let them know that they can talk to you about anything. Right. That's exactly where I come from with it as well with my kids. It's just, you know, there's going to be a lot of circumstances that they feel they have to face on their own. And I want them to know they don't have to, we're here for them. Same way it was, you guys just described it, you know, the laughing and having fun, it really just creates that bond with them so they can feel that comfort with you. So that's a great takeaway tip. Exactly. Well, awesome. I want to go ahead and thank you guys for being on the show today. Anytime. Appreciate it. Thank you. There you have it, folks. Laughter, good for the body, the mind, and the soul. It's a great thing for forming bonds and just forming connections with people. So don't forget to enjoy those moments together when you can. I am so excited to have Dale and Lisa back for episode 19. I'm telling you, we just have so much fun on and off the mic, and it's such a great time to be with them. So I hope that you enjoyed listening to the show as much as I enjoyed producing this show because they're just a, a fun group to be around. So remember, until next time, dream, survive, thrive. Thank you for joining Sarah for this episode of the Changing Earth Podcast. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Day After Disaster at www.authorsarahfhathaway.com. If you love this podcast, please head over to iTunes and let everyone know by leaving a review.